Thanks for being with us today. So as you've probably noticed throughout the conference, there's a, a huge shift happening. But I contend the shift is not about cloud. And the shift is enabled by the cloud. So a lot of companies today are looking at transforming themselves by using cloud technology to deliver magical end user experiences, but also to become more nimble, to become smarter about their customer, to go faster. And if you think about cloud technology today, it allows us to do at least two things that were not possible before. The first thing is that it automates a lot of the complexity out of our lives. It allows us to really focus on what matters. And the second thing, it allows us to extract a lot of intelligence out of a, a world of data. Now, that's all great, but you can't really transform just with technology. You've probably heard it from many, many of our customers. Because you have to rely on people. You have to rely on culture and a shift of mindset. And so I have to contend that this transformation can't happen unless you're breaking the silos within your company and also you're putting the customer in the middle of everything. So McKinsey has been studying transformation for a long, long time. And they came up with three traits that companies who are successful at transformation have. The first one, they align their corporate strategies with their digital strategies. The second one, they have leaders who are nurturing a fast-changing agile culture so that it set up their own people to maximize the potential of technology. And the last thing that those successful companies do, they focus on people, they focus on talent, they focus on process, structure, and systems. So it looks like if you're using cloud technology, right, and you're focusing on culture, you're going to be successful at your business transformation. But then there's a question from a lot of customers. Does it make sense financially? Right? Am I going to get a good ROI out of moving to the cloud? So just recently, there's been a study by IDC and Cisco that came out and found out the following things, that cloud-based applications, on average, drive three millions of upside in revenues, and one million in terms of cost reduction. So that a total of four million of upside. And if you know that across the world, you know, companies go usually between 50 applications to running more than 1,000 plus applications, that makes hundreds of millions of dollars that cloud can deliver to the bottom line of a company. So it feels like that if you are using cloud technology and you are making sure that your culture is changing, you can come up with very successful transformation and great impact from a financial performance. But instead of hearing it from me, why not hearing it from six of our customers? They have kindly agreed to come in and share with all of you their journey to the cloud and how they've been transforming their businesses. So with no further ado, I'd like to welcome to the stage Kim Manstedt, who is the CIO of Nielsen, and she's going to share with you her journey to the cloud. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm thrilled to be here today and share with you our incredible story of Nielsen going Google. Start with a little bit of background on our company. Nielsen is a global measurement and data analytics company that serves our client by providing the most complete view of consumers. We study what consumers buy, what they watch, and what they listen to in over 100 countries. Over our 95-year history, we've continuously evolved what we measure, how we measure, and how we can provide the most robust platforms for rich data analytics and meaningful insights to our clients. 
We have over 40,000 associates who work on these solutions every day. In 2015, our technology team began to search for an enterprise platform that would enable faster collaboration, more robust innovation, and we were looking for that kind of platform that would allow the teams to work together from all the various Nielsen locations real time. Yesterday, I shared that our six-month program ended with a very successful single weekend cutover for the company. Today, I'd like to share a few of my favorite examples from the success story. First, real-time collaboration is a must. We found that with Google Drive. Have you ever had one of those long nights where you've worked tirelessly for a couple of hours on that presentation or document that was due the next day, only to end in frustration when you saw the blue screen of death and you lost all of your work? Or have you ever waited hours for a colleague to send you the latest version of a document so you could spend just two minutes adding the final touch? That simply doesn't happen with Google Drive. We no longer have time to waste, and we can't lose any work. We've also seen great collaboration and other ways that G Suite has helped throughout our company in teams like finance, where we have a rock star team led by Nate in our Geneva office that fully embraced Google and was excited to change the way they work. Today, they use Google Sheets and Google Data Studio to enhance the transparency and provide better reporting capability to their accounting process. They also use G Plus that allows them to better communicate and engage with their employees. In HR, our teams are using AppMaker to develop custom surveys for individual unique personas for the new hires. They feed this into Google Stu uh, Data Studio, and they use the reporting to help them make better decisions during that onboarding process. Our next success came with Google Sites. So we knew it was time to make a change in our company intranet. We wanted to have a site that was easier to maintain and manage, and most importantly, we wanted to give our employees a fresh digital uh, experience for how they access information about Nielsen. We did that with Google Sites. When we started, we found that there were a few capabilities that were no, not yet available, so we partnered with the Google product team and we were thrilled when we were successfully able to launch with enhanced search, a G plus feed, and enhanced corporate branding that made our deployment a complete success. Within the first 24 hours of Go Live, we saw thousands of associates that were on our new, brand new company intranet from their mobile and, and laptop devices in the first 24 hours from 74 countries. It was absolutely fabulous. I would say the biggest uh, change, and for me, the biggest win was how our teams connected and developed deeper relationships. High quality video is an absolute must with today's workforce. Our teams use Google Meet to discuss ideas, to collaborate on our most challenging problems, and to give each other face feedback face to face. Paired with the Google Jamboard, we finally have all the benefits of in-person collaboration without asking our employees to travel all around the world. Our travel expenses have decreased, and the best part is that the time for our employees that they spend with their family and friends has increased because they're not sitting in airports. I could go on and talk for quite some time about G Suite and the features, but I want to spend a minute and talk about the second half of our success story, which is equally important and that's the world-class partnership that we have with Google. I talked yesterday about that cutover weekend and how day one we went live with 56,000 accounts at Nielsen on G Suite. That day, over 100 Googlers came into our Nielsen offices around the world to help us with that transition, to answer questions, and to celebrate with us. These Googlers were not part of the professional services team. Their job was not customer support. They were simply Googlers that volunteered to step away from their day job because they were as excited about our big day as everyone at Nielsen was. I knew at that moment that I had a partner in technology that was deeply invested into Nielsen's success. Since that time, we've provided feedback to the Google product engineers 
and they've developed hundreds of features on G Suite that make our work more efficient and a lot more fun. We've given feedback through the Trusted Tester and Early Adopters program. It's a phenomenal way for our associates to provide feedback on those product features. I can't tell you how amazing it is when I see the buzz, whether it's on G Plus or within Hangout Chat, when an employee realizes that their feedback has just become part of a Google feature. For all the successful technology leaders in the room, you know that the best way to manage change is to empower your users and have them make, have their voice into the change. And that's what we get with Google. Finally, we've heard a lot this week about Google's incredible technology and their open platforms. Google has also provided us with a great open client community where we can talk amongst ourselves as clients and help with the product roadmaps, share best practices in a way that is extremely valuable. As members of Google's uh, technical advisory board, we've benefited from those relationships with our peers. It's an incredible opportunity for the community to come together, make the Google products better, and to truly transform the way we work. In summary, our transition to Google has been an amazing success. We have had challenges along the way, but in every way have come out with a stronger platform, the cultural alignment that we wanted in terms of a more engaged, robust, collaborative environment. And it's been a wonderful way to get to work with such a great partner like Google and to bring smiles to all of our associates' faces. Thank you. Please welcome Sri Shavananda. Good afternoon. Um, at PayPal, we've been able to move 15% of our infrastructure fleet into the Google Cloud. And we're just getting started. Today, I want to walk you through the journey that we've been on. But before I do that, I want to tell you a bit about PayPal. Most of you know us, but we are a group of companies, PayPal Core, Venmo, Braintree, Zoom, and most recently, iSettle. Together, what we are attempting to do is to make sure that we can connect the world with payments. We are a two-sided network. On the one hand, we have more than 200 million consumers. And on the other hand, we have about 18 million merchants. And for a total of 237 million active users. Last year, we did about $456 billion in payments. And our mission, on the one hand, is to power digital and mobile commerce, and on the other hand, to democratize financial services around the world. Let me walk you quickly through the technology stack we have at the company. At the bottom most is our infrastructure layer, what we do internally in terms of building our data centers, our network, our hardware engineering teams, our storage databases and ops uh, teams. On top of that, we have a layer of technology services that we use internally within the company to help subsidize software development across PayPal, but at the same time create some level of homogeneity and standardization as we build applications and services. Up from there is the payments operating system. This includes identity, payments, risk, compliance, and credit. And finally, the heart of PayPal, which is the experiences. And these experiences are, are the ones for merchants on the one hand and for consumers on the other side. The most important thing we do at PayPal is, of course, security. This is the number one thing. We are in the business of trust, and security is the, the number one thing that we need to build for. To give you an idea of the scale, as I mentioned, we did $456 billion in payments last year. We operate in about 200 different markets about 100 currencies. And last year, the peak day was about 29 million payments on a single day. This translates to about $14,450 per second on average. Just imagine the peaks. To 
power all of this, we have 2,700 different application services, which are built and maintained by about 4,500 engineers across the world. Last year, in 2017, we did 17,000 software releases. Our internal infrastructure is about 200,000 servers, about 27 megawatts, and we have 238 petabytes of data, all growing at about 30% year over year. The cloud opportunity for us to begin with was all about the developer and test environments. In 2015, we made the decision that we want to move to the public cloud and start to leverage what was now a 10-year-old industry. In doing so, we wanted to first learn from pilots, and we picked the developer and test environment as our first pilot. The reasons that we moved to the public cloud for are as follows. Number one is scale. As I mentioned to you, the number of transactions we take across the number of countries we have and the number of customers that we serve is very large. And the number of payments at PayPal is growing at about 25% every single year. Second, we wanted to make sure that we were accessible and present for our customers in their locale, in their geography and region. For this, we couldn't go and build data centers all over the place. We needed a partner that could do this with, do this with us. Second was flexibility. We, have, we are a payments business, and we are uh, available everywhere around the world. And with mobile commerce, there is huge variations in the amount of payments that you get at any point in time of the day, or any day of the week, or any week of the year. To work with this, we needed a flexible infrastructure that could scale up and down to our demands and our needs. Third was the fact that we had to meet regulatory obligations. We are in 200 different markets. Each one of these markets is a jurisdiction. These jurisdictions have laws on money, and we need to be compliant with all of those. In some cases, we need to process and store data locally across various uh, countries in the world. And finally, in terms of efficiency, one, to understand what kind of a fleet we have, number two, to continuously optimize how much we are using, and number three, to ensure that we burst up when we need something, and we don't have uh, hardware on premises that is not get, going to get used for a long time. To give you an example, our peak days for payments are in December. Once we capacitize for those payments, we don't need that capacity till later in the first quarter of the year. With a public cloud, we have the ability to flex up and down. And finally, the rate of innovation. Public cloud gave us the ability for us to get started on the modernization journey and to ensure that we're using the latest and greatest feature set that is available to make sure that our services are of the highest reliability, the highest security, and are providing the latencies that our customers need around the world. The reason this is what I start with is it was important that as we went into the transformation, we had to convince all the people internally within the company on the reason why we are doing this. This is the main reason why we moved to the public cloud. So our journey, like I mentioned, started in 2015 with Discovery. And through 2016, we picked four cloud environments and ran a bunch of pilots to actually compare them side by side. At the end of that test, we picked the Google Cloud to host um, our applications in. We then started our journey in the beginning of 2017. January of 2017 is when we started the project to take all of the dev and test environment and move it into the Google, uh, Google Cloud. Through that journey in six months, we had an amazing partner with Google, and we learned iteratively through every sprint we went through. And on uh, June 28th of uh, 2017, we cut over dev and test over a weekend to the Google Cloud. This was about 15% of our infrastructure fleet. Now, when we did this cutover, it was not all rainbows and unicorns. We had some challenges, and I want to share that with you as well. And those challenges, number one, with, with respect to security. As a company that is focused on trust, our biggest need was to make sure that we were as secure as we were on-prem. In doing so, one, we wanted to ensure through tests that we, we had the risk mitigation and the controls required in the Google Cloud Platform. 
And with the partnership with Google, we got comfortable with this and, and started to move in that direction. Second and most important thing was culture. In any transformation, there are three pillars. There is a change in mindset, a change in the tool set, and the change in skill set. Most people start with the tool set. In this case, the Google Cloud was a tool set. But if you don't change how you work every day and how you think of your application services and infrastructure, those tools will not help you in the long term. Third was architecture. Lift and shift was not going to work. We had to change our applications to make sure that they were ready for the public cloud. So we went through a process of ensuring that as we were making this migration, we were using the best of what the public cloud had to offer and not rely only on the uh, paradigms that we had built on in the past. We also had a few challenges with the features. Even though public cloud is a 10-year-old industry, Google was still building many of the features. But through the partnership, we worked on various bridge technologies to help with our journey, and that wait was well worth it. And since then, Google has built those features for us, and we've incorporated that into our system. So taking you back to the journey, I mentioned how in the mid of 2017, uh, 2017 we moved the dev and test environment into the public cloud, and with that, 15%. And since then, we've had a ton of new learnings. We've now run this environment for a whole year. And in doing so, we have now qualified many other use cases that we can start to move to, uh, to production. As we build the build out of, uh, begin the build out of the production zones, uh, we now have an intake process for the use cases. We are allowing for the development teams across the company to bring in the use cases that they want to migrate, qualifying the, those use cases both from a security perspective, a uh, technical uh, uh, reliability perspective, and also from an efficiency perspective. And we intend in the next year to take a reasonable amount of our web and mid-tier and move that to the Google Cloud as well. In doing all this, uh, we've had amazing learnings. And uh, Google Cloud has been a tremendous partner. We have challenged each other, and I think we have learned from each other in this process. But we feel like the journey is just getting started, and we are continuing to make progress towards putting more workloads in the Google Cloud. Thank you. Please welcome Mohammed Hamidi. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak to you today at this prestigious event. I'm Mohammed Hamidi, the Chief Technology Officer of Sky UK. Sky is the largest entertainment company in Europe. We serve 22 million customers, we employ 31,000 colleagues, and we invest close to $8 billion per year on content that our uh, customers enjoy to watch from the comfort of their homes or while on the move. A major part of this investment is buying sports rights. The crown jewel of those rights is the broadcasting rights of English Premier League matches in the UK. We call them uh, soccer in, in the US. Let me give you a taste of what our customers love us for. New channel dedicated to the Premier League with 126 live games throughout the season. Rewatch key moments of live games with the timeline feature on the Sky Sports app. And join the conversation with a new Premier League debate show. Oh, Chelsea are the champions. Feel it all with Sky Sports Premier League. It is costing us $1.6 billion per year to get the rights for 126 matches, which equates almost $12.7 million per match. This is premium content, which we know our customers value, and uh, part of the reason they subscribe to Sky Sports. The way it works is that Sky gets money from our customers in the form of subscription or time passes. We get money from advertisers uh, who buy advertising slots. We pay the Premier League, who then pays the clubs to invest in players, 
coaching, stadiums, and the development of the sport. Of course, big clubs can have other sources of revenue, like sponsorships, ticketing, merchandising, but still, broadcasting rights represent a pillar, an important pillar of their investment model. Smaller uh, clubs, it is vital for them. This model has worked well and has allowed the football and other sports to develop to the great level that we are enjoying today. Unfortunately, like in any industry, there are bad guys who are trying to illegally stream football matches without owning or paying for the corresponding broadcasting rights. This can harm the sport industry and cannot be tolerated. So, as an industry, we had to find ways to defend our rights. The Premier League went to court in the UK and obtained a historical ruling obliging major ISPs in the UK to disconnect the pirate streaming sites while the matches are being played. But this represented a huge technical challenge as we needed to quickly identify and disconnect the pirate sites while the match was being played. This is a problem for security, a problem for uh, legal, but technology had to play an important role here. The team came up with a smart alternative solution which relied on the power of Google Cloud. Sky being itself the second largest ISP in the UK, we used NetFlow to sample all the traffic we have on our core network, which carries nine terabit per second of traffic at peak. This has produced a huge file, which in one year reached the size of 500 billion data records that needed to be processed. Using BigQuery and an in-house uh, algorithm, which costed around $10,000 to uh, develop, we are now able to continuously study traffic patterns and produce an always up-to-date list of suspect pirate sites. Those are then checked and once confirmed to be illegal, are shut down. The time needed to run the query on Google Cloud is less than 30 seconds, and it costs 23 cents for every run. These are the 23 cents of my PNL that I am most proud to spend. The result is a phenomenal reduction in Premier League pirate sites accessible from the UK, with all the corresponding benefit to the football industry. This success has opened the door for a wider collaboration between Sky and Google Cloud, as we have decided to build our data lake on Google Cloud platform. This is a key component of our internal data factory transformation program. One of the deliverables of this program, which is a very ambitious program, is to join up all available data in a customer-centric way. This will allow us to progressively personalize every customer interaction to make it quicker and more relevant to the individual customer needs, as it is enlightened by the history and the context. This ranges from content recommendation to offer management to troubleshooting journeys during a service call. And this across all channels. And the sky is the limit. Thank you for your attention. Please welcome Justin Arbuckle. Afternoon. Any Canadians in the audience? There we go. Who's heard of Scotiabank? So for those of you that haven't, Scotiabank is based in Canada, but we're in 55 countries across the world. We've got 90,000 employees, about 24 million customers. That's about the same number of people as there are in Canada as a whole big markets in Mexico, Peru, Chile, Colombia, and I'd like to think that we are the most technological bank you've never heard of. 
So I'd like to share some of our experiences on our cloud journey and reflect on some of the practices that we have found that actually work. We call this the cloud method. But if there's something that you take away and you forget everything else from my conversation with you today, it's this. Cloud is a method, not a location. We need to stop thinking about cloud in terms of where. Where are we putting our data? Where are we deploying our applications? And we need to start thinking about how we develop applications, how we modernize the organizations that we work with using the cloud and some other technologies. And so one of the critical ideas that I think we have become aware of is to try and avoid something that I call the two island problem. And maybe you have this too. Do any of you have a cloud program? Yes? If you don't, you may be at the wrong conference, by the way. But if you have a cloud program, that cloud program is getting applications into the cloud. But what's it modernizing? And what is that cloud program doing to solve some of the inherent, essentially systemic problems that you have within your organization? So in a financial services organization, this means things like highly fragmented data, probably years and years of legacy, many layers of APIs creating chaos and confusion. How do your cloud projects help that? How do you modernize your organization? Because in the end, if you have one island of fantastic 12-factor cloud apps on one side, and you then have a whole bunch of other stuff whose code base is older than I am, right? Not that old, but old, yeah? What have you actually done to your organization? And so for us, the critical finding is when we are doing cloud programs, where we are taking our um, uh, resources and our projects and applying them uh, across our major markets, such as Mexico, Peru, Chile, Colombia, how can we be using those projects to modernize and solve inherent problems within the organization? And so you can think of this metaphorically, I suppose, as building a bridge building a bridge between these two islands, the islands of the old and the, the legacy kind of technologies that you need to be modernizing, and then the islands of the new, the highly scalable, dynamic, elastic environment that we, that we invest in when we invest in cloud. So how do we do this? Well, one of the things that we've developed, and we're going to be making an exciting announcement about it today as well, is a product called Accelerator. What Accelerator is, is essentially a software development pipeline. And what this software development pipeline does is it takes all of the steps that you need to safely deliver and deploy code to production. And it creates this abstraction layer and this interface to all of the tools, such as source code repositories, artifact repositories, security scanning tools, which are super important in our business, and all of the other tools that you need. But it's this single pipeline that we use for both cloud native apps as well as non-cloud native apps. So this convergence to a single pipeline, a single way of actually getting to production, means that what we can also do is we can achieve what I believe is the fundamental benefit of cloud, and that is being able to deliver change faster. Because if you buy the premise that cloud should be modernizing your organization, and if you buy the premise that just putting stuff on the cloud because it happens to be shiny and Google gives out great swag, what are we achieving if we are not using that opportunity to continually use every single opportunity we push code to production to also be solving and modernizing the rest of the organization? And so what this accelerator pipeline really does is it allows us to push change. And pushing change means new features for our customers, it means a continual rolling improvement to the continual enforcement of security policies across the whole organization. But it also means that with every single project that we are rolling out, we are continually refactoring and improving our API landscape and our mesh. We're continually moving and migrating our databases. Why? Because we have this single way of controlling that. So the control plane of cloud is the development pipeline you use to get to cloud. And this has been a key lesson for us. So cloud is a method. This is the method we're talking about. How are you getting to cloud? How are you pushing the changes continually and at high speed? And so something that is really important, though, 
about this pipeline is actually that people are hard. And in driving change in a large organization, there are some engineering challenges that we are all facing and that we all have to work on, but there's so much cultural change. There's so much cultural change that we have to think about a new way of organizing, a new way of creating teams, a new kind of trust and relationship between our business stakeholders and the technology teams. Now what this single consolidated pipeline really does is it removes the easy to automate, the obvious tasks that we require every single team to get right. It removes that from the conversation and it allows us to focus and allows our engineers to focus on delivering real value. And it allows us to also then focus more time on helping our engineers operate and organize in an agile manner. And so we've made a huge amount of investment in this kind of technology. And as I said, the accelerator product is what has been the result of this. Now we're also committed to being more like a software company. The organization that I run at Scotiabank, it's called the Platform Organization. We're like a little software company inside Scotiabank. And we're hiring, by the way. And it's not that cold in Canada. But this little software company 100% believes in the brains and the talent in this room and other rooms like it. Which is why we're announcing today the open sourcing of a component of the Accelerator framework. This is just the start. You will see continual improvement and far more pushes of open source software within the Accelerator framework going forward. We would love for you to participate with us, help us make this better. Um, because truly, if we get this right, if we build this bridge between the two islands, we all win. So I invite you to check it out on GitHub and come and work with us. Thank you. Please welcome Miguel Campo. Good afternoon. How is your day going? So the film industry is based on the ability to work with talented artists and the ability of studios to bring audiences. So what today, what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you about some of the work that we've done with the Google Cloud to marry stories and audiences. So we've seen for some time now that it's getting more expensive to bring customers and to attract talent. As an industry, we are moving from the bottom left to the upper right quadrant. And this move is building up tension between tectonic plates. On the one hand, the inertial forces embedded in the old ways of doing things. On the other hand, the what I'm calling AI-enabled capabilities. Audience discovery. Audience discovery provides crucial information to executives and filmmakers, especially and critically for films that are non-sequels. Now, audience discovery is intimately related to the process of storytelling. When making a movie, filmmakers and the studio executives, they need to know and articulate why does the movie need to be made, what is new about the movie, and also who is this movie being made for. These questions are hard to answer precisely. And here's the key insight. The story and the audience are not set on a stone. The alignment between the story and the audience doesn't just occur, it's the outcome of a process. It's, uh, studios and filmmakers have actually many knobs that they can adjust, adjust to achieve this alignment. It's a complex problem, and it's a problem that benefits from data-driven insights, which is why studios have been busy collecting data and building tools. So today I'm going to tell you about two of the tools that we've built at Fox. The first one is called Merlin. And Merlin answers the question of what type of movie are we trying to make? Merlin looks at a bunch of data. It looks at the trailer of the movie through computer vision. It looks at the plot of the movie through NLP. And then it outputs a report that describes the likely DNA of the movie based on the data. The second tool that we've built is called Nightcrawler. And it basically answers the question of is this the movie that we were trying to make? And to answer the question, the tool does 
massive parallel multitest sampling hundreds of different audiences, and it outputs a sophisticated report that helps us describe with unprecedented level of detail who are the core fans for this movie, who are the persuadable audiences, and who are the no-shows. So now I'm going to tell you about The Greatest Showman, because this was the first movie in which, in which we actually applied the data. So on paper, this movie was set to be bringing similar audiences to the movie La La Land, which was another musical that opened the previous year. Our initial reads of online chatter in social media were in fact pointing in the direction of young female demos, which was consistent with the hypothesis of La La Land. The surprise came when we started to use the tool. When we analyzed the trailer, we discovered a broader audience that wasn't necessarily centered on younger demos. It was centered on family movies, it was centered on Disney musicals, and feel-good empowerment dramas. This was very important because it suggested changes in our marketing strategy, changes that we think ended up having a big impact on the success of the movie. So fortunately for us, the movie did pretty well, grossing north of $400 million worldwide. So studios are learning to learn. They are learning to compete for stories and audiences in a world of incomplete but multidimensional data. And they are also putting in place the processes to measure the alignment between stories and audiences, which is going to be key for rapid re reallocation. Finally, they are building, they are building AI-powered tools, not to dilute, but to amplify the work of talented, bright filmmakers, and to produce more relevant and urgent movie experiences. Thank you very much. Please welcome Michael Lysett. About 15 years ago, I was on the phone to my sister, and I happened to mention to her that as I was approaching 30, things had changed. I could no longer eat and drink whatever I wanted without putting on weight. She asked me if I had heard Weight Watchers, which I had, and that kick-started a conversation where she taught me the fundament fundamentals of the program. She told me that you were assigned a daily and weekly points total and every food was assigned a points value. As you ate food, you ate into your points allowance. It seemed interesting, and most importantly, it worked. I lost the 15 or so pounds that had been troubling me. In subsequent years, I would find myself having to actively work to keep on top of my weight, and would lean on the Weight Watchers principles that I had learned. But I needed some other motivators. I found challenging my friends would push me to work harder, primarily to avoid being the victim of their brutal sense of humor. But I discovered that key was, the key was community on my journey. So much so that several years later, when I wanted to learn the fundamentals of a new programming language as an evening hack project, I decided to explore an idea that would let friends lose weight together in a fun way. A key personal thing that I learned from that project was I was far better very deep in the back-end code than I was in front-end visual design. But then four years ago, when I was having fun building out one of the world's first Bitcoin funds, I was approached for the role of head of engineering at Weight Watchers. Even though I felt that Weight Watchers had lost some relevance, I decided it was worth a conversation. The night before my first interview, I had gone to bed and then realized I should check out their website before the meeting. So at 11 p.m., I got up to take a look, and this is what I got on the homepage. Needless to say, I went into the interview very cynical, thinking that this was a company that was ripe for disruption by technology competitors. During that interview, I discovered that the way I looked at Weight Watchers was the way that the management team looked at Weight Watchers. I realized here is this iconic 50-plus-year-old company with an inspiring mission and this credible opportunity to disrupt it from within. I became obsessed. Now, things were obviously not perfect, 
That message to members was up for seven hours while the site was down to do an upgrade. I can never say that I went into this job without my eyes being wide open. But this told me a lot. I was pretty sure there was a legacy monolithic architecture with legacy engineering practices and a culture that needed to evolve. It was an interesting time in Haltech. The proliferation of apps and hardware in this space was not insignificant. And people were excited to try different things. When it comes to health and wellness, there is no shortage of opinion on what's good and what's bad, resulting in consumer confusion. People want to get healthier. They're just not sure the best way to do it. Just have a look at these actual headlines, which highlight the amount of opinion out there, some based on science, some not, and how overwhelming it is. People have become lost in a wellness fog. There is a tremendous need for an effective science-based program combined with community to provide inspiration and connection. Delivering that program via the best technology not only makes it relevant to today's consumers, it makes it accessible to everyone, scaling world-class behavior change to millions of people around the world. So when I started at Weight Watchers, on the technology team, we started to work on three fundamental areas. One of the key components of getting any transformation right is culture, and culture shows up in many different ways. When I joined, we were relying heavily on external partners to help us build our experiences. In fact, we didn't have a mobile engineering team in-house. Organizationally, we were very siloed and not very collaborative. And our engineering practices, technologies, and processes were dated. As I had guessed, our technology was indeed monolithic and had been incrementally added to over the previous decade or more. One by one, we started to take on these problems. We started to hire more of our own engineers. We started to use modern technologies. We embraced modern engineering practices. We sat with our teams and not our function, and we became agile. When I started, we were partnering with a consulting company to help us with this, but we decided to do it ourselves, adding people who had worked in these types of environments to our team. On the tech front, we embrace a modern microservice, API-driven, cloud-based architecture. We rewrote many of our key web and mobile experiences, partnering closely with our friends in the product and design team to create intuitive user experiences. And finally, we became human-centric. As we looked at the root of why Weight Watchers was successful, it was based primarily on two things. First, a science-based program that worked and was livable. Second, our passionate community where people find inspiration and solidarity. Both were equally important. In 1963, Weight Watchers was founded by Jean Neidich in her living room. And we actually like to say that we were the first social network, but the truth of it is that communities existed from the earliest days of civilization and are core to our social fabric. It is then no surprise that an individual's personal transformative journey that they would be more successful in a community. At that time, our meetings represented our community, but as the world was changing and adopting more digital solutions, we needed to bring our community to life digitally. Our mobile app, introduced in 2009, had all the program functiona functionality for tracking food, activity, and weight, but not the community that was so fundamental to the in-person experience at Weight Watchers. Bringing this to our digital experience would help us meet people where they are and offer a more personalized solution. One of this, oh, sorry, out of this, our community, which we call Connect, was born. It is a digital community for our members which captures support and physical, the, the strong physical, sorry, captures the support that strong physical communities provide with a 99% positive comments on, on all of, um, our posts. We created a safe space for people on their transformative journeys where they could get unjudged support and inspiration from their community. The evolution of our offerings to our members was very visible. And we could also see the engagement of our members increase. As we became, were becoming human-centric, we also identified some other things that our members wanted. 
weight loss was no longer enough. People wanted to feel healthier and well. Weight loss on its own was less relevant, and while people, uh, while people wanted to lose weight, they wanted to get there in a way that was more about what you gained, which is strength, confidence, energy, and happiness, than what you lost. And we're all not alike, so we need to be able to understand people better, guide them on their journey in a personalized way. So we actually reimagined our mission. Today, our mission is to inspire healthy habits for real life, for people, for families, communities, the world, for everyone. To do that, we need to know you and meet you where you are. GCP and its suite of data tools are crucial on this front as we aggregate data from disparate parts of our organization to power personalized experiences. We also need to enable you to find and create inspired communities, which Connect is uniquely suited to do. And we need to help you build powerful habits rooted in science. When I look back at my first experience with Weight Watchers, it was a science-based approach that is the world's most livable and successful program, combined with the community and my friends that helped me lose those 15 pounds. But that overall feeling of health and wellness is what I remember most, and that still rings true to me today. Over the years, I have picked up many healthy habits. I have modified things like my normal breakfast and my normal lunch. These were some of the things I needed to work on. The opportunity we have going forward is to personalize that experience even more so every individual can get the support they need on their journey. Tackling the best of, sorry, taking the best of behavioral science and leveraging the best of technology is a key evolution for us so we can anticipate our members' needs and provide them with the tools and inspiration they need before they ask for it. Helping members to find and, and form communities around life stages, like new parents or recent college grads, as well as their passions from food and fitness to fashion and travel. We have a vision of growing our community of more than four million globally into a much larger, more powerful movement that helps each individual define and achieve their version of healthy. Thank you. Okay, what a great set of stories, right? I was blown away. So a while in back, I took some notes, I worked for you, uh, and I thought I would just basically summarize what we heard uh, in a couple of key takeaways. And again, uh, you can do what you want with it. But the first thing is that what I heard is that, again, cloud enables magical experiences that are not imaginable today or could not be imaginable before. Um, and the one thing that I thought was really fun is the story from Mohammed of Sky Broadcasting, you know, where he really had to fight a massive fraud problem. And he had to think about, like, how am I going to analyze nine terabytes of you know, data per second? And he started to use BigQuery. And with that, uh, with a fraction of the cost, he was able to detect uh, piracy sites and take them down. Um, Michael at uh, Weight Watcher, by the way, Check the stock for the past year, it's gone up big time. So if you doubt that cloud is adding value, uh, this is a great example. Uh, you know, his view that uh, with cloud, you can bring the power of the physical location to the app and really create a community of users, right, that can interact in a safe way was mind-boggling for me. And I really like Miguel, uh, 20th uh, Century Fox. Uh, you know, his notion that every new release is now is influenced by data and, and models. This is just striking. So really, with BigQuery, you can determine what you guys like in terms of uh, new movies. The second big bucket for me is that cloud allows companies to be nimble, to be smart, and to operate at speed and scale. Uh, the one thing that I thought was uh, mind-boggling as well was PayPal. If you think about it, Tree has built up an architecture that allows him to go from a couple of updates a year to 17,000 
on that scale. And I don't know if you've noticed, but he said because of that, this is increasing the rate of innovation at PayPal, which is really what we're after. Justin Scotia Bank, the move to the cloud. If I was summarizing it, and that was really well, well put, he said, the cloud is not where we go. The cloud is a methodology to modernize your IT. It is the how. I thought it was really profound. And then Kim at Nielsen, you know, using G Suite to really improve the productivity of uh, their employees, streamlining the way they work, but also helping their employees to innovate by uh, introducing new usage like uh, Jamboard uh, or Meet. And then the final bucket for me is how the shift of mindset is so important if you want to succeed in your transformation. And here, I, I think, again, Justin said that what's the most important thing, right, is the shift in the mindset of the engineers, not so much the technology planning, which is kind of easy. Um, Kim talked about how just using G Suite has helped her team to become world-class partners with Google. I thought it was also a kind of an interesting thing, and we never think that way. And then finally, Sri, Michael, and Miguel as well emphasized that their engineering team had to embrace modern technology, and they had to really learn from coding to DevOps to really uh, uh, have an impact and be, be really useful to the transformation. And I have to applaud uh, Scotty Bank and uh, Justin for coming up with an open sourced code uh, called Accelerator. So thank you very much. Um, the Canadians are in the room. So, uh, <laughs> so anyway, uh, this is the gist of it. I hope you enjoyed uh, those presentations. I want to thank again our customers. Big round of applause to all of them. <laughs> and uh, this concludes this customer session. Thank you very much, and I have a good rest of the day.